So thanks, Renee, and um, welcome, everyone. Uh, good morning. Um, as Renee said, I'm the Deputy um, Chief Information Officer, Acting Chief Information Officer for the Food and Nutrition Service. We, you'll sometimes hear us call ourselves the Food, Nutrition, and Consumer Service because that is part of our mission area. So we have another very small agency, a sister agency, the Center for Nutrition Policy and Promotion, CNPP, that also lives in the building with us um, that we take care of. So that's why some, you'll hear me interchangeably say FNS and FNCS. Um, today, I wanted to talk to you guys about a few things. One is sort of what we do at, at, at uh, FNCS and USDA to a larger extent. Um, and talk about some of the things that we, we have going on. And then uh, I wanted to, as a second part of this, talk a little bit about um, IT as a service and how it works with your program offices, uh, especially for those of you who are in government or are directly supporting government missions where they do that. And then lastly, I do want to um, talk a little bit about professional development because it is a passion of mine and it is one of the things that um, on the ACT Executive Committee that, that I focus on, um, and actually our, our PD folks are in the room here today, so Laura and Nicole, glad you guys could join us as well. Um, what I wanted to do, if you looked at the at the uh, the agenda before this, there's like some formal Q&A session, but honestly, I, I'd, I personally have ADHD, and so I get tend to get distracted if I have to wait until like something that, that happens at the end. Probably some of you guys are the same. So as I'm talking, if you do have a question, I would rather this more be an interactive type session. Um, and that goes for the folks who are on the phone, too. Feel free to send those, those emails in, um, and I will try to answer the questions that you guys have as we, uh, as we continue to do that. So Starting off, let's talk about USDA and the Food and Nutrition Service. So USDA, very, very large government agency. Um, we do everything. There are 29 sub-cabinet agencies that are part of USDA. And my particular group, the Food and Nutrition Service, our mission is on feeding people. Um, one of our, our big programs you guys are probably familiar with is SNAP, the Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program, which you might know better as food stamps. Um, last time I checked, there were about 47 million people receiving some form of benefit through SNAP, so fairly significant portion of the population. Half of those, by the way, are elderly and children, um, which is you know something that doesn't always come out in the debate. Um, the other thing that doesn't always come out in the debate, again, last time I checked, um, a fairly significant portion of people who receive SNAP benefits are on it for less than a year. Um, the problem is the, the chunk of people who are on it for seven or more years, which is a fairly significant minority of part of the population. Because those are the folks who are, you know, mired in poverty, and that, that's going to take a lot more than just us providing some supplemental assistance. Um, but we also do a number of other things, too. So um, some of you probably have kids in school. They might get school lunch. We do the school lunch program um, across the country. Um, we also provide assistance, food assistance during disasters. It's called DSNAP. Um, we work with women's infants children's programs, WIC programs. Um, that was recently um, uh, big news up on the Hill. By the way, the Hill is debating whether or not, as I understand it, whether to um, make agriculture and a couple of other bills a mini omnibus. They're calling it a mini bus which if it happens, I'm like, awesome, because that means you know, we can work and we don't have to worry about you know, the, the, the process when it gets to be late September and October. However, they're a little busy this week. I believe today they're electing a new majority leader, so um, that's, uh, they probably won't be dealing with us this week. Um, but anyway, we have lots of other programs too. So uh, FDIPR, which is the um, uh, uh, group that works with the uh, American Indian tribes, um, a lot of that actually takes place out in, in the southwest and west, as you can imagine. So our mountain plains and our, our western region take care of that. FNS actually has, in addition to our headquarters here in D.C., seven regional offices. So we've got one in Boston, one in Atlanta, Chicago, Dallas, Denver, and on the west coast in San Francisco. Um, and then, of course, up in New Jersey, because why not? So I, I always wondered why the Mid-Atlantic one was in New Jersey, but, you know, it, it is where it is. So. And the other thing that I always found exceptionally entertaining is the fact that they're the ones who, uh, who administer Puerto Rico. 
Um, you would think that would be our southeast regional folks, right? But no, it's administered out of New Jersey. So they do the Caribbean office um, as well. Um, so that's mostly what FNS does. Our sister agency, CNPP, you're probably also familiar with it, even if you don't know it, because they're the folks who do MyPlate, um, which used to be the food pyramid, and now it's the, in the shape of a plate. So that's been very popular. They also have uh, an application which I think the last time I checked has something like 3 million subscribers, but it, it's called Super Tracker. Um, and you can just go to supertracker.gov and, and find it or just do a Google search on it. But uh, Super Tracker allows you to do, uh, to put in what you've eaten during the day and it'll give you how close you are to the recommended uh, nutritional value of uh, what USDA puts out. You can also do some menu planning and things on there as well, too. Uh, I, I know I'm talking a lot about food, which is really, you know, here we are the first thing in the morning, but, you know, food's a big deal. I mean, it, it's one of the, it's something that everyone has to have, right? And so one of the, the things that I really got when I came over to FNS from the Treasury Department was the fact that um, building nutritious Foods, uh, food menus is something that's really hard for people who don't have a lot of money. And so that's one of our missions, is it also is education. Um, our website is in the process of upgrading our menu uh, selection on there. It's, uh, we're going to have a new section on there called What's Cooking, which actually consolidates four different areas where we had um, recipes. And it's going to tell you that, you know, if you put in, for example, I have beans and I have chicken and I have rice, what are the types of recipes I can make with that? And not only are we going to have it in English, but we're also in the process of, of getting it translated into Spanish as well. So uh, lots of good stuff to happen with the Food and Nutrition Service and USDA and CNPP. Um, and, you know, as an IT guy, I support those programs. So what we do, and this sort of go, gets into the second part about supporting your programs, um, IT is exceptionally important because all the stuff I'm talking about has been automated over the years. So I don't, some of you in this room are probably old enough to remember when food stamps were actually food stamps. You know, they, they were blue and they were brown and I think they were red if I remember right. But um, at some point in time, they changed over to the, the electronic benefits card, right? So that's what you see now. And, and what happens is at the beginning of the month, um, if you're accepted into the program, uh, the money that is transferred from us to the Treasury Department is automatically deposited on those cards. And so people have immediate access to that. So in some of these small towns, which are, are heavily dependent upon this, including the stores, you will see um, that some of the stores will actually open up at midnight on the day of the, uh, when, when the, the, the um, transactions are due to hit because they'll open their stores early that day just so that people can get in and start buying their monthly allocation of food. So in some cases, um, uh, the benefits that we provide actually are contributing to the economy of the town. Um, now, one thing I should probably tell you guys is that what we do um, – what we do to, to support this is really more at the administrative level because all the states actually administer the programs. So it's sort of like trying to herd 53 different cats because I'm talking states, territories, and, and um, uh, other governance areas as well. So, for example, like Puerto Rico and um, Guam and the Marshall Islands, which we also provide support to. As a matter of fact, Last year, there was a typhoon in the Pacific Ocean, and we actually had to provide disaster assistance funding to Marshall Islands and ensure that food was shipped out there. So <clears throat> the states all have their own ways of administering this, and all the programs are different, right? So while SNAP may be done at a state level, I guarantee you the school lunch programs are done right down at the county level. So they all have different ways of doing this. So one of our great challenges is providing management oversight by means of management evaluations to ensure that things are consistent and that information is shared between the states. We have a state systems um, office that actually tries to take um, good practices from one area, share the code, and then move it over to another um, state and let them do things like that as well. So we've made some progress in that over the last few years as far as being able to um, ensure that the programs are administered at least the same way in all of these areas. We have folks who go out in the field who actually do this as well. We have um, 
a couple of different ways that we ensure um, integrity. And it used to be called fraud, waste, and abuse. The new catch word, in case you guys hear this, is now integrity. Um, you're going to hear that across government um, for whatever reason. I guess, you know, sort of like the IRS every few years with their, um, with their systems modernization, they just give it a new name, but it's still systems modernization. So when you hear integrity, you can, um, you can, your, your catchphrase is that that's the reduction of fraud. Our SNAP program is one of the best at integrity in the federal government. We've got about a 1% rate um, of uh, fraud. So that's actually really impressive. I think we're the second lowest. There's, I think, uh, Social Security Administration might have us beat. But uh, one of our goals is to improve that even further. We do um, a number of different things to ensure that that rate stays as low as it does. We actually have folks who go undercover, our RIV investigators. Um, and it's really interesting when you meet these guys. They get together about once a year where they all are able to uh, you know, do various things. They, they all have mobile. Uh, laptops, mobile communication, so we get them all together at one point in time so we can do all the upgrades to their systems and such like that. But most of them literally are dressed as if they are poor folks themselves. And so, and they have to so they can blend with the crowds and go out and uh, one of their jobs is to, for example, go to a store that's not authorized to sell benefits and they'll try and buy stuff using their EBT cards. And, you know, if the store takes it, then that's the first indication that perhaps something is wrong there. So that's one of the ways that we actually do this. The other way with um, so much now coming down the, the pike in the way of um, electronic ways to do things, we have a couple of really large systems called STARS and ALERT, um, which are very long acronyms, and I'll let you just look them up rather than attempt to have you write them down. But um, STARS and ALERT are our back-end data analytics for all the transactions and all the stores that, that, that um, actually use them. So what it does is by it, it allows us to identify patterns where there may be actual abuse going on and then to coordinate with law enforcement so we can go in and take a look at that. And because things are always changing, it's, it's, the same, it's almost the same thing as any, any type of security, right? So you've got to stay one step ahead of the bad guys because as they get better and they come up with new scams, we have to figure out ways to spot what they're doing before they do. So that's why data analytics are such a, um, you know, a big thing to us. I think I'll pause there for just a second because I just talked a lot about what um, FNS and CMPP do and see if anyone has any, any questions. No? Okay. So let's talk a little bit about FNS and USDA. So because of what we do, and we're a relatively small agency um, right now, about 1,500 people nationwide. Um, half of them are here in D.C. and then about 100 or so in each one of our, our regional offices. We also do have, you know, our investigators and some smaller field offices spread around the country as well. Um, but as, as far as USDA goes, where there are about 130,000 people, we're relatively small potatoes. Um, however, we're one of the more uh, technologically advanced groups there. And one of the things that we really like to do, um, and I've had three of these now, is what we call FNCS Tech Days. And what that entails is either we're debuting a new technology that we're piloting. The last one that we did was asset management. Um, and so I'm not going to tell you the companies, but we actually had two companies that we're working with where um, they're working together for us to actually control all of our assets. And it's kind of new because typically you have inventory programs and other inventory programs. Matter of fact, we had 36 different things that could in some way figure out how to do inventory. So we're consolidating this, and the one group was actually sort of a portal that collected all the data streams. The other group that we asked to present was one of the data streams that actually collects that, that information. So um, as we implement, and we did a pilot of this last year, and it, it, it turned out pretty well with our telecom, so we decided to actually come in and, and do it full bore. And not only are we doing our IT to include our software licensing, but we're actually also going to add all of our um, furniture and our office equipment and such like that, too. So I've got our logistics folks on board. When they get their inventory management system up, that'll be yet another data stream. So what does this mean for my customers? This means that at any point in time, you can actually go in and see what is assigned to you. And you would be surprised how often, and I've, I've done asset management at one point in time throughout my career, you would be surprised how often people have you down for multiple things. They might have you down for three different PCs because they never took the old ones out of inventory. So this is really a way for us to actually cut down on um, 
you know, superfluous records ensure that there's, there's um, uh, less overlap and also actually from a cost standpoint probably cut way back on our licensing because I'm pretty certain that we're over licensed as far as software goes. So um, that was the last one we did, but we also did stuff with uh, virtual desktop and remote access. Um, we also did one on um, business as a service, which I think is an interesting concept. Um, so you're all probably familiar with as a service type, type options. This was sort of taking um, your overall project management and using that as a service. So uh, the way I normally do this stuff is in the morning, we'll have it focused on strategic level things so that the CIOs um, and CTOs from USDA and other agencies can, can get the big picture. And then the afternoon, we'll do the product demos. So it's really kind of, because I know I don't always have people for an entire day, so you have the option to stay for the entire day. But um, if you want the CIO, you can have your CIO come in the morning, have your technical folks come in the afternoon, and, and they can coordinate later. So we, we're trying to get on a schedule where we do this at least twice a year. I'd love to do this about four times a year. We'll see what happens. Um, but typically, I invite the other USDA CIOs and CTOs, as well as some CIOs and CTOs from other agencies where I've got some contacts. And uh, we typically get anywhere from 20 to 40 people. It just kind of depends on the topic. Some are more popular than others. But it's one way that we're keeping FNS on the cutting edge of some things as opposed to um, some of the other agencies within USDA. Um, as a matter of so where I'm going with all this, not to brag about FNS, which I like to do, but um, to kind of tell you that <clears throat> some of these things, if they wind up um, being uh, uh, something that other agencies want to do, is it will allow us to actually do more enterprise services, and that is a big thing for USDA right now. USDA is actually one of the agencies that has taken um, shared services very seriously. Um, we were one of the first agencies to actually um, have our mail go all um, enterprise. Um, we're in the process of now converting to Enterprise Active Directory across the entire department, so multiple sub-cabinet agencies. Um, our mobile devices are all done that way. Um, we have a pilot going with printing, which is meh. Um, I'm not terribly thrilled with that one, I'll just tell you guys. Um, so they're not all successful. Sometimes they have to have the kinks worked out of them. I will tell you one where we resisted way early, um, I, early on was um, electronic faxing. And that was because we were getting a much better price on our product than what was being offered at the enterprise level. But it worked out, and we, we got our waiver for that, and we used it. And then ultimately, um, they were able to negotiate the enterprise vendor down to the price, actually down to below the pricing that we were getting, at which point in time we're, we said, OK, we're ready, we'll swap. And they provided relatively the same amount of services. I mean, electronic faxing is electronic faxing. There's only so many ways you can you can slice it. So sometimes it actually pays to say, no, no thank you for us, because it makes folks negotiate a little bit more. So um, USDA, big thing um, right now, enterprise type um, initiatives, shared services. Uh, I will tell you the, the USDA CIO Council just set up an enterprise initiatives steering group, um, which I got myself on. So we are now in the process of meeting on a regular basis. Um, to start figuring out what our shared initiatives are going to be. And I believe Cheryl Cook, who is the USDA CIO, her vision is that um, it won't all be USDA controlling this, although right now her group, ITS, is probably the largest support group. Um, if there is an agency that's really good at something, for example, we're really good at Drupal. We were the first ones to put up a Drupal website. We might be the agency that actually does the lead and controls all the contracts for that and provides the services um, to the other agencies. So those are, are two of the big concepts that are coming out right now. And I, I can also tell you, um, I know that we're serious about this because Cheryl just appointed a third deputy CIO for enterprise initiatives. So um, some of you might know Sue Bustles. Um, at USDA, she is. So now we have three deputy CIOs. There's Charles McClam, who does operations, Sue, who does enterprise initiatives, and then um, Joyce Hunter, who is also a big supporter of ACT IAC, um, who is the policy person. So, and she was in industry for a long time as well. So she brings a unique type of thing. Um, anyone have any questions yet, Kurt? Yeah, um, I had a question about you know, when you talked about your technology days that you were presenting. Yeah. 
Who's the audience for those that you guys present? Is it FNS, yeah. USDA General, or what's Yeah, it, it, it's multiple. So uh, if you were on the phone, just, just to repeat in case um, the button mics didn't pick it up, his question was, um, who's the audience for the FNCS Tech Days? It's actually the, um, uh, my base audience is, well, first of all, my staff, but then uh, the USDA CIOs and CT, CTOs, any of their technical staff that they want to bring over. And then um, I've been around the business for a while, so I've got a fair number of contacts in other agencies. So I usually invite other agencies like Treasury, Library of Congress, um, ATF. Um, there's a, 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 a half a dozen, almost a dozen at this point in time, other agencies that I invite. Sometimes they send folks, sometimes they don't. It really just depends on if it's something they're interested in. So it, it, it's fairly broad, but if it catches on, I'm hoping that we continue to get more folks to it. Um, and every time we've done one of these, it's actually, we've actually gotten very good feedback on it. So I, I think it's probably going to continue in the future. So we'll do them as long as people are interested. Any other questions? Okay, so that's kind of what's going on with FNS and USDA. Um, if you think of other questions about that later on, that's fine too. You can let me know. Um, why don't we talk a little bit about IT and support your programs? I, I dabbled in it, and then I just wanted to make sure that we finished USDA. Um, IT supporting programs um, is a big deal, and I think this is actually being worked on right now in um, our human capital. Um, SIG, uh, which is a special interest group for those of you who, who don't know. Um, they're talking about uh, support of actual mission programs uh, by IT. I can't tell you how important this is. You would think that this would sort of be the way just common sense, right? But it's actually not. In a lot of organizations I've seen that IT is going one way and the mission program is going the other way. Um, I'm fortunate at uh, FNS in that my program executives actually understand the value of IT and most of the time, I will not say all of the time, but most of the time they actually ask us about stuff before they want to try and implement it. Um, I think one of the keys to success there is the fact that um, we have used our program office, our PMO, our program managers, um, almost as customer service advocates. So they meet regularly with the program offices find out what's coming down the road, um, help them implement new technology, um, new applications, advise them, and then actually come back to um, my group, the Office of Information Technology, and um, propose these new ideas um, and actually work for the advocacy of, of the program offices. So as a result, what we get is a very tight-knit thing between our program offices and us where they know that they're not going to succeed if we don't succeed, and we know that our mission is to help them succeed. Um, it, and, and really, if you want to take this to the way it works for those of you who are in industry, it's the way that you have to build your relationship with your government counterparts. It cannot be us and they. It has to be, it has to be all us, okay? Um, your government folks can't look at you as just a resource to be discarded. They need to actually think of you as part of their staff. And yes, if for those of you who are contract notice, I know technically you can't do that. I get that. But you have to think in that way that, indus that your industry contractors who are there and working um, to help you with your mission are truly your partners, that they need to succeed for you to succeed, and they need to make sure that you succeed so that they succeed and can make a profit. And that's kind of what it's all about. Trust me, when we're negotiating, it's not so that we can get you guys down to the lowest possible amount. Well, I guess there's part of that, right? Otherwise, there wouldn't be LPTA. But um, I'm not a contracting officer. I mean, we do want you guys to make some kind of profit, um, you know, because otherwise, why, why bother to work for the government, right? But um, so the partnership is the key, and partnership between industry and the government folks in IT, and then between the combined, that combined group and the program mission areas that are in the agencies is also the key. And so, again, I believe um, our uh, human capital SIG is, is working this right now. And so if you are interested in getting into those discussions and helping to provide a solution, that actually might be something good that you could actually um, participate in. Um, Renee, is there anything more on that? that... Um, I have a question from Gail on the phone. Okay.
across, I, 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 across my organization? Yeah. Okay, so I'm, well, within OIT it's pretty easy because basically I, I, have, I have quarterly all hands meetings. And so one of the things that we do as part of that is briefings on, on new technology and I'll have one of my staff actually do the briefing. Um, and so all my folks um, get to see it. As far as um, bringing in um, to a wider audience, I'm going to answer this on multiple levels because I'm not quite sure at which level she asked. Um, if I want to, uh, to do it to include my contractor partners, um, believe it or not, we actually do have, we don't have these as often as our all hands days, but we actually try to do it FNS um, contractor appreciation days because um, they actually to kind of help us out. Um, so we actually like to recognize our high performers in contracting as well. Now those ones we do probably about every, um, probably every year, sometimes it's two years depending on if we've got new folks on board, um, rather than <laughs> quarterly like we do with our all hands meetings. But um, that's one way to do it. Another way to do it is, you know, we've got internal distribution lists. Um, if it's truly, truly a new technology that no one's um, really heard of and we're not quite sure where we're going with it, we'll get all the key leaders in the room and brief them on it. Um, FNS actually has um, an, I, um, an IT information um, investment review board, which is um, the senior leadership, which, and, and I know I'm, gonna, I'm about to do a whole bunch of acronyms, so um, we have an SEC, which is not what you think it is. It's actually the senior executive council. It drives me nuts that they pick that, but Anyway, so that makes up most of our IT investment review board, our IT IRB. So when we have a truly new initiative that's going to uh, um, cost money to the agency that we have to put out there, we have to go before the SEC and the IT IRB, present our case facts, um, do a business case, the entire thing. And before it gets to that level, we've already vetted it on the boards that are lower within our organization. So we have a change control board, we have an application control board, um, all these other lower boards just within my organization. If it's something that we want to um, take outside of FNS and go to USDA as a whole, then um, the, the process would be, well, now that we have this new enterprise initiatives group, I might bring it up through the enterprise initiatives group. But before that, um, I would have taken it to the CIO advisory board, um, which meets every Thursday, um, except for one, and that fourth Thursday is when the CIO council meets within USDA. So if it makes it through those, those steps, um, then uh, the CIO council would give us a mandate and we, we could potentially start implementing it throughout USDA as opposed to just FNS. Um, part of your business case, as with anything, certainly with shared services, is that it can't be duplicative, right? So we're talking truly new technology or initiatives. Now, it depends on what your initiative is. I have an initiative that I'm going to be starting this fall um, using uh, what's called a corporate needs request um, to actually upgrade all of the video capabilities in my regional offices um, because I've got kind of a hodgepodge out there now. And so over the last year or so, we've been able to upgrade most of our video capabilities at headquarters so they're all pretty much the same technology, same type of stuff. I can take a remote from one room and it works in another room, things like that. So now we're going to start working on our region so that it will gradually improve our VTC capabilities over time. So hopefully that answers the question. Um, did you have anything else you want to say about the human capital SIG, Renee? Um, <coughs> uh, just that the opportunities to engage a really um, broad across the organization and really kind of um, develop and develop and focus the kind of then a key player as part of the human capital SIG. Um, and there I'm talking, I mean, they're talking about chief pointing officers and kind of all sorts of broader topics, but as well we have um, other areas of business that um, have the opportunity to engage. Yeah, so I'll, I'll, I'll run with that and, and basically tell you guys that one of the things that I, I think we should be doing um, as ACT IAC, and I bring this up in, in the board sessions all the time, so I'll just tell you guys again and then you can tell your representatives. Um, I really think we should be out proselytizing to not only CIOs, but to CTOs, to chief learning officers, to chief human capital officers, to essentially the whole CXO suite. Because one of the things that I found in the professional development programs that we run is that IT is not just IT. All those groups that I just mentioned are a major part of IT, and IT is actually a major part of them. So our classes are much more rich. Our classes um, actually produce more product when we have folks 
from those different groups that are in there. I started doing this at FNS. I'm now, I actually went to one of our program offices um, and just made the pitch and said, hey, you know, Voyagers is coming up. We're about to throw that out there. We'd love to have some of your, your PMs in this group, even because we know they use IT, so this would be a great thing for them to use. They'll get a little bit more familiar with how industry works. Everyone wins in this, in this, in this group. So, you know, I, I would tell you, I think it's important that, um, and now that we've actually, we're kind of, we're just this week up to, to, to full strength in our professional development program. Um, it's really time for us to go out and really start our, start punching this stuff up. Um, which leads me to the fact that next Tuesday, the 24th, we're actually having a professional development after hours event downtown at the American Institute for Architects, right? Um, and it's, it's after hours, um, um, five to seven. Um, right now, I think there's about 60 people signed up. Yeah, I'm looking at Laura to confirm that, which is not bad, but we can do better, especially because we're going to be handing out a ton of information. And unlike most things at act act this is free. So, um, you know, this is actually something that, yeah, that uh, you want to tell your government folks, about, that your, your government contacts about as well. So not only will you get to hear me pontificate again about how I feel about PD, but you'll get to hear a lot of other more interesting folks talk as well. Um, but we are going to be talking about our three programs that currently exist, as well as a fourth program that we're setting up. So just real quickly to recap, and this does not excuse you from going next week, by the way, because I'm just going to do a real high level. We have three programs that exist right now. The, um, the newest one, which also happens to be the most junior, is um, called Associates. And it's for people in government and industry who are within their first five years of being hired. And uh, I can tell you, since I ran the, the, years, the first year's class, um, we had someone in that class who was literally six months out of college. Um, which was really entertaining. On the flip side, we also had someone who had just reached their fifth year. So we had a real spread of folks in that, in that group, but it was a great group. Um, smartest group yet. Um, I, I, was, I was really, really amazed with them and, and what they knew. Um, millennials can be a challenge, but they can also be really, really innovative. And I had a ton of fun working with those guys last year. So um, building on that successful thing, we're, we're now in the second year of that class, and, and we hope to continue going forward with that. The second group um, is the Voyagers, which is actually coming up. Um, I think next week we're actually going to be putting the um, uh, application out on the street for folks to apply to. That is typically for people who are between, let's say, 7 and 13 years. We're a little fluid on, on the number of years. But uh, roughly GS 11 through 13 and 14 um, in government, um, these are the folks who are your rising stars. <laughs> the people who are next going to be stepping into your senior leadership roles in a few years. Um, it's a unique program because one of the things that we do in it is we actually offer uh, mentoring. Um, all of the Voyagers get a formal mentor for the time that they're in the program to actually help them through. And I can tell you some of these relationships wind up lasting past just the, the, the period of when the class is. Um, Voyagers and the other one that I'll talk about in a second, Partners, both have off-sites. Associates does not. Associates is all local because we figure relatively junior folks are going to probably have a tough time getting their companies or agencies to buy into them going off-site, whereas folks who are a little bit more senior, your rising stars and such like that, this is now where companies and agencies want to make an investment. So they're willing to let them, us do these off-sites where we can um, teach them some real leadership skills. Um, the Voyagers graduate at mock, so the class that just graduated is now out and about and um, um, all anxious to start doing things for act IAC. The third group is right now our senior group, and it's called Partners, and it's the one that I graduated from back in 2008. It's for folks who have 15 or more years of experience in government, and these are the folks who you think are going to either be your next SES if you're in government or your next um, C-suite folks if you're in industry. Um, they have a similar type of arrangement as the, the Voyagers do in that um, they have a couple of offsites. They graduate at ELC. <coughs> so the current class that is, is right now in partners will be graduating um, this year in, in September. Um, the partners, um, actually are, are, are taking a book from, are taking um, a page from the uh, associates book this year because they actually did a breakfast on gamification. 
um, which is actually near and dear to my heart because in real life I'm, I'm a heavy gamer. So, um, But gamification is a whole other topic I could talk for another two hours on, which I'm not going to do today. So um, I like the fact that one of the things that's very cool about all three of these programs is that they continue to evolve, and that's because we get new leadership in every year who has different types of ideas and, and how they want to do it. Um, real briefly, I just want to tell you we are setting up a fourth group to complete um, the thing, so you'll be able to pretty much go to ACT IAC for your professional development life if you want. Um, and it's going to be called Champions. We expect it to um, start up not with this year's Voyagers, but with next year's Voyagers. And that is going to be for your SESs and your C-suite folks and your presidents of companies, Jay, um, who always wanted to do all the other stuff but couldn't get in because they own companies or they're SES and you know they're not eligible for the other programs. So this is a, um, an opportunity for them to build their network, get some executive coaching. Oh, and by the way, also be some of the mentors for our Voyagers. So it's um, what we try to do is hook the associates up with the partners, and now we're going to hook up the Voyagers with the champions. So you'll have that two-level gap in there that's built in. Um, and so we're kind of excited about that program. We're, putting the, we're starting to put the curriculum together now. Um, the new boards that are coming in for both ACT and IACT are probably going to be the ones who do the bulk of that stuff. I've got a year left on my contract on that. So this is probably the last professional development program I'll get to do. But I'm fine because now we've got them all covered. So um, that's my, my brief um, uh, uh, ping for, for next week. And I hope you guys can all make that. Um, we're going to go over it in much more detail. We're also going to talk about the Fellows, which is the alumni organization. We just had the Fellows picnic um, a couple of weeks ago. A lot of fun. Had about 50 or 60 people that, that came out um, to the park for that. Um, and it's a great way to keep your network intact. There's over 700 people, and I didn't realize the number was that high until I actually just looked at it. There are 700 people who have gone through act -act professional development programs um, since 1998. So if you join one of these things, you are in good company. Um, I th yes, Renee. Um, so can you kind of talk about the collaboration that you experienced in the program and then how that's more, because we talked earlier about how you went to um, invite people that you know from right. and then how that, when you see kind of the future of government collaboration and other people are like Right. So the one thing I like about, so she asked about, uh, to kind of talk a little bit about the collaboration that, that comes out of the, the, the professional development programs. Um, one of the things that I actually like is that they're trusted zones. So if you tell someone something, they know that this is supposed to be something where you can speak freely um, and not get called on it later or get, you know, reported to the Washington Post for something just because you asked a question. Um, it, it's a tremendous amount of freedom if you're a government person. It's great if you're an industry because now you can ask those questions that you wanted to ask. Um, I will tell you that if you do it the right way, all these programs, you get out of them what you put into them, right? So um, my partner um, that some of you guys may know, Marty Cummings, um, we actually didn't even want to be partners when we were first partnered up. Um, and that's another story I'll tell you guys some other time. I won't bore you with it now. But it's really funny because we actually became um, – really good friends as well as partners, and we actually complement each other very well. Um, so much so that last summer I actually wound up being in Marty's wedding. Um, so, you know, these collaboration type things can last much longer. I will tell you, um, I will, if I get a cold call from someone who actually has been through a program, I'll probably take that one as opposed to a real true cold call, just because I know that they already get it and they understand um, what collaboration is all about. And if you think back to what I said earlier about you guys need to collaborate with your government IT folks and your government IT folks and you together need to collaborate with the program and the mission areas, this is great training for that, okay? And it will teach you how to be open and honest. I mean, one of the things that people tell me all the time um, is that, wow, you're very candid. And I'm like, well, okay, great. I, I don't really know any other way to be. So um, I never was very good at saying stuff just to make people happy. Um, as someone will tell you, I'd rather be right than happy. So um, anyway, you know, you have to be honest and open and frank in your discussions. As a matter of fact, the first time I met Laura, I said, I'll just apologize now because I'm sure I'm going to offend you at some point in time. So, um, but that's, it's a great, um, it's a great way to think because once you establish the fact that you're an honest broker, then people believe what you say, right? 
Now you have to, you got to follow up on that. But if you're an honest broker, even if you bring bad news, it's okay because the person that you're bringing that bad news to knows that you're telling the truth. Now, I will tell you my other tip on bringing bad news is when I bring the bad news, I always say, and here's what we're going to do because that way I don't get the whole, all right, well, how could you let this happen? I'm like, got to get back, got to get this taken care of and all that stuff. So um, I guess that's my, that's my tips on collaboration and how to do it. So does anyone else have any other questions either in the room or on the phone? Kurt? Yeah, Rory, I just, you mentioned about collaboration, and one of the thoughts that just popped in my head is that you've had over 700 students that have gone through so many very professional programs and whatnot. Um, is there, have you seen anything that's starting to make a change that pertains to those that have had the professional training or are gone through it where they're <clears throat> Yeah, and, and, and yeah, and, and, yeah. So for those of you on the phone, in case you couldn't hear them, that the, I'll sum it up as success stories for collaboration with within government and industry. Um, I, I think yes. I would say out of those 700, probably you know due to folks either retiring, moving out of the air, or whatever, probably about half of them are active and fairly like. And by active, I mean we see them at least a couple times a year, um, or, or they participate in things. I would say um, yes because, the, you know, part of this is all about passion, right? And it depends. If you have someone who's gone through this program, so I, I can tell you right now that the folks who work for me, um, who we've put through this program because I'm passionate about it, they're passionate about it, and my industry partners who wind up working with me know that I'm passionate about it too because I'll have what I like to call after-hours discussions. Um, you probably know them as happy hours, but it looks better on your calendar that way. Um, so, and if they come to that, I usually wind up talking about collaboration. I'm not there to, I mean, to me, it, it's really about what can we do, what, what's new cool stuff can we do. I'm about delivering better service. And I do think that some of the things that, that ACT IAC has done on collaboration in general is starting to work its way into the federal IT community as a whole. Um, I know certainly some of the white papers that we've, we've presented to um, Van Rokel and other folks um, on the US, USA CIO Council, you know, which is the entire government, um, I think it's really starting to get there. I mean, you hear people using the right phrases. Um, and if nothing, even if they're just repeating a phrase, if they repeat it often enough, they'll start living it because they'll start seeing someone else do it. I'm also a big believer in show people and do stuff, and then the folks will, will follow along. So I do think that there has been some. Um, like I said, I, I can point to my own success stories. I mean, I can, I can point to some companies where I know that the um, active participation and collaboration where folks who have been through this program have now risen up through the ranks and are actually running their businesses that way. I can point to um, individuals in government who I know went through this program who have now come, gone on to become SESs um, who are now implementing this thing in their, in their um, agencies. The, the issue is that change like this takes a long time because from probably the 1960s until the mid-1980s at least, there was this whole thought of we versus they, government versus contracting. And so change comes slowly, right? So as we get out of that whole Cold War military industrial complex and get into a new whole citizen service oriented type of business, it's going to it's going to take off. But it's going to take a while. It's like anything. I, th I heard a futurist tell me one time, and I think this is pretty true, it takes about 25 years for any new idea to really truly become um, something that you use every day. So if you look at when the PC was first introduced at the time that it actually became ubiquitous at the desktop, it's about 25 years. Um, and that's, that's just one example. Look at your phones. Think about your, what your, what's in your pocket right now. What did those things look like 25 years ago? Um, if you want to see, I've got a whole display in my office. but um, so. It, it, I think that yes, to answer your question, it is it is happening, but it's happening slowly. And like any new idea, it takes time for it, it it to gel. And I think we're about halfway through where we are. Maybe we can accelerate the process by things like this. Anyone else? Just a clarifying question for Karen. Um, when you were mentioning the, the, the IT skills of the future. Yes. 
Um, that is the work group. I was, I was there. I actively participate when they ask me to participate. I'm actually on the emerging technology SIG. Um, and so I have to kind of uh, grab my time where I can. But they have asked me to do things in the past, and I am happy to do things for them in the future because obviously professional development is um, something that, that um, I care a lot about and I'm passionate about. So I'm happy to uh, do some guest work with uh, the Human Capital SIG if they'd like me to. Okay, Kurt. Sorry, Rory. Not a problem. Yeah. So first, I, I'll, I'll characterize the first part of that question as um, how do we come in and do an effective presentation, essentially, or how do we do stuff that's actually going to help you? Um, and the second part is, you know, what, what do you see on the horizon as things that we can help you with over the next couple of years? Um, so I will tell you the first part of this is, for God's sake, do your homework. Um, understand what agency I, I'm with and what, what part of uh, a larger agency I might be with. And oh, by the way, it might be good if you actually knew how to pronounce my name, because I will tell you all three things that I just said have all happened to me where someone didn't know my name, didn't know, ask me about a requirement for a completely different department, much less my agency, um, and then didn't understand that FNS was part of USDA. So um, for God's sake, do your homework, look at what our programs are before you come in, um, and then pick something where you see a lot of, of things in the news and say, hey, you know, we're really good at this. Um, maybe you'd like to hear what we do on this. Do not give me the generic emails that I get every single day of my life, which go straight to my trash about, we're great in this, we're great in this, we're great in this. Hey, did you know? And they're all, now they're all personalized. It used to, you know, um, be, uh, you know, just, just a generic thing. But now it, it's sort of like the, um, I, I call it the, the, the Nigerian banking scam of IT because it's basically like if you sign up with us, we'll do everything that, that's wonderful in the world with this particular type of, of process, whatever it may be. It's, it's either storage, it's security, it's, it's whatever it is. But I, they, they're almost all worded exactly the same. And I'm like, you know, really, do you really think someone's going to respond to this? I guess they do because that's why they send them out. So if you're going to send out an email, be thoughtful about it and make it obvious that it's not just part of a blast email that as a BD person you've had to send out <coughs> to everyone. And maybe your company feels that way, but you know what? The revolution can always start now, so you can actually change the way that they look and do business because if you wind up dealing with an executive like me, and I will tell you, first of all, I am not a typical government executive, so keep that in mind. But if you wind up dealing, doing business with me, I look for stuff that's unique that no one else has. Um, we meet with a lot of small businesses because FNS actually has a requirement, as does USCA, for a tremendously huge amount of work to be done through small businesses. And I'm talking like 60%. It's, it's ridiculously high. I've, not, I've never seen this anywhere else. So we meet with lots of, of small businesses. You know what they all tell me? We're great in about 20 different things. And I'm like, no, you're not. You're, you're not. You're just not. So I, my first question to them is always, Pick one thing, tell me what you're best at. What, what were you founded on? What was your first contract on? What was the first thing? Because that's what I'm going to think of you as. The other stuff comes later. You know, if you do a good job and we hire you, um, maybe we'll look at expanding to some of these other things that you say you do. But if you ask the right questions as a government IT executive, you can probably quickly find out, even if they won't tell you what they're good at, because they're going to just know more about that stuff than they are about the other things. So. Um, and the other thing is, is I would tell you, don't come in and, and I hate nothing more than obvious people who are salespeople, right? Um, business development, for those of you who are in that, it, it's a long-term relationship. You're in it for the, the long haul. It's not about going in and making a quick sale because if, it's, if for you it's about going in and making a quick sale, take me off your dial list right now. Because um, 
I, I work with the money that I have. It may, it's more about the, you may not get something for two or three years, but if I'm impressed with what your company does, I'll pick up the phone and I'll call you and say, hey, we're doing this and I want you to bid on it. So BD is about the long haul, and it doesn't matter how many times I buy you a drink if we're at a conference together or you buy me a drink. It's not about that. It's about what you guys can do and the fact that you learned something about us and you followed up on a regular basis. Um, I will tell you a story. When I worked over at Treasury, <coughs> and this is when OMB started first doing the, uh, the, the 53 process a few years back where you have to justify your budgets and such like that. Well, none of us knew how to do it. And I had had a meeting a couple of years before that with a guy who said, well, we know how to do this. And frankly, at that point in time, I didn't even know what the hell he was talking about. So, But it, it stuck in my mind. And two years later, we actually said, what are we going to do? We have no one on board who knows how to do this. We're going to have to do a contract. So I stuck up my hand and said, um, I think I might know a guy. Let me call him. So I actually called him. He was at a completely different company, but he had kept the same phone number. And I said, we need you guys to come in and give us a proposal on this because we have no idea what we're doing. So um, he came in um, with his, his specialists, um, made the pitch to our um, senior leadership, um, got the contract. We wound up doing a couple million dollars worth of business with him. That's all because he invested the time in the relationship. So just one story among many. Um, what, are we what, what are we doing that you guys can help us? Um, you know, I, I, hate to, I, I hate to just jump on the bandwagon, but, you know, I, I still think people don't know what the hell they're doing with cloud. Everyone loves to talk about cloud, but they don't really know how to implement things the right way, especially from a security standpoint. Um, and so I personally think that what's going to happen is we're going to have some kind of hybrid type of thing where either there's, a, there's public data, which we want um, for transparency purposes for everyone to see, but there's also stuff that you need to keep internal, not because it's, being, it's trying to be hid, but because it might be a law enforcement purpose. It might be um, PII that can't be put out there um, that people can see. So I think we're going to have some kind of hybrid where there's a public cloud and then there's either an internal private cloud or literally still private storage because in some cases that's the most secure ways you can make it because um, what better way to protect data than to just unplug the thing from the internet, right? That way no one can get into it. So that, that's always your last best option, or at least have that stuff that somewhere in there. So cloud's one thing. Um, security, um, everyone um, has security issues. Um, we've been having them for years, and they're only going to get worse. Um, there's some countries in the world that aren't too friendly to us um, that, that train their folks from day one um, to, to uh, uh, penetrate and get into U.S. networks to steal technology, to steal all kinds of things. So that's going to be a requirement for us to come up with new and better ways to do things like that. Um, I really had to deal with that when I was at Treasury because we had um, an intelligence component over there. But you guys didn't know Treasury is actually one of the intelligence bureaus, but um, they really are. So we actually had um, uh, both a, um, a TS network over there as well as a classified network um, at the secret level. And so uh, um, I, I can tell you security is going to be a big thing for every government agency over the next few years. I think the last thing that, that I would say is probably um, shared services. Um, but shared services done right, okay? So right now most big agencies do some sort of shared service. But what we ought to be able to do is pick and choose among shared services. In other words, look at government as other vendors, right? So um, we fought about a year-long battle at FNS to actually go outside of our um, data center, which is NITSI, and go to another data center because we actually felt that they provided, um, for the environment we were standing up, they provided better service at less cost. So we were going to be able to save our taxpayers about a million dollars over three years. And we had to fight the whole, well, but it's not NITSI. How are you going to do this? How are you going to do that? We finally able, were able to get our business case through it. and. Uh, so we were successful, and we're now standing that uh, environment up over at the Commerce Department. So I think the future of shared services is all the government agencies that offer them, and GSA has jumped on board with this big time, um, and I think they want to be the biggest shared services provider of all. But, uh, you know, you, you ought to be able to go where you want to, get the best bid that meets your needs, and then go and do that. And uh, it, that's another one of these changes that's going to slowly have to percolate its way through government. Anyone else have any other questions? <coughs> the 
mentioned the business of service and some of the shared services. How, how are you handling the procurement contracting interaction uh, between the program and, and acquisitions? Um, we always find you can work with the program side, but then if there's procurement, the requirements change. Yeah, it's a challenge. Yeah, so the, the question was, how do you um, how do you work with your your contracting office um, and and programs to get to make sure that what your requirements are actually make their way into the contract? Um, I I won't lie to you, it's tough, and and every agency is, is different. Um, the 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 best thing that you can do is to try to is is to um, if you're in government is try to ensure that you actually have a contracting officer who knows IT, um, which is not as common as you might think. I mean sometimes. You know, you, you say my requirement is for a, a length of Ethernet cable and you wind up with a, with a rope. Um, so they, they really have to first understand the actual requirement um, and not just and not know where to substitute things. And then it's key that you meet with them on a regular basis so that your stuff doesn't get changed. So that as frequently happens, what we want to be a best value contract turns into um, an LPTA, which drives me nuts. Um, but you have to understand the um, pressure that contracts is under too. They're under, for their metric, and I hate this metric, they're supposed to be reducing costs and, quote, saving us money. Um, well, I would maintain that if you have a best value, you'll ultimately save more money from the return on investment because you'll get a better product and you'll have less things break. So on that one, I'm on your side, guys, you know, those of you who are in industry. Um, and it used to be that way, but LPTA is just so prevalent throughout the government. This is one of these things where um, those of us who are in the IT programs are going to have to fight back and just say, no, that's not what we wanted. This is how we want to do it, and this is how. You, you have to make sure that you have a voice in how the, the, um, the uh, requirements are done and how the ranking factors are done. As far as working with my program areas, um, again, that goes to that collaboration up front to ensure that they know that we're not there to take their stuff away from them. We're there to help guide them through the process, work with them, make sure that they're um, – their requirements actually get reflected in that the service that they get is actually the service that they want. Um, again, I'm lucky at FNS because almost all of my executives understand the value of IT, which was, th this was great to hear because all the mission areas actually had to present to the USDA CIOs as a whole, and we went through a whole process of about three months where we did that, and some of the other CIOs came up to me after and they're like, oh my God, your executives actually understand IT, and I'm like, yeah, well, yeah. Because we talk to them about it, you know, talk to your executives and they'll actually get it. Most of them, um, you know, will tell you right up they are not IT folks. They just want to be able to understand it. And so, so talk to them like they're executives and give them the right answers and they'll be your advocates. So hopefully that answers your question. Yep. Any others? One over here. Tim? Yeah. <clears throat> yeah, so the question was, is there a gold standard for, for information assurance or, or security? Um, you, know, you know, I don't know, because right, right now with, our, with our, our friend Mr. Snowden, security is kind of getting a bad name. Um, it, it, and it, it's not always the way it seems to be. It's always an insider who actually d does all the damage. It's not one of our simple little IT guys who is the one who's exposing it, but um, just an observation. Um, I will tell you, when I was at Treasury, um, their government security operations center was spectacular. Um, I mean, those guys were, were actually so good that they were um, finding stuff before it was even in U.S. CERT. I mean, they, were, they wound up being one of the sources for stuff out in the wild. Um, and that was a proprietary um, uh, piece of software and analysis that was actually done by their, their contractor that, that was out there at the time. So um, if you want to talk to me later, I'll, I'll tell you to talk to over at Treasury, and you can see, you know, what they're still doing. Now, granted, I haven't been there in about five years, but um, I, 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 can, I can tell you one story. Um, when I got to FNS uh, four years ago, um, because those guys still knew me, one of them actually called me up and said, hey, we, we just caught something, and one of the recipients is at FNS. Um, so I'm like, cool, thanks. I gave it to my people. We wiped it off the network. We didn't get notified by... USDA's um, Security Operations Center until the next day. And we had actually already wiped it off the network. So these guys were catching stuff way before it ever had a chance to even get through the nets. Yep. Yeah, 
I think it was. So the the the, um, the question was, how did you how did you um, make your 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 case to get outside of NITSI and use another data center? I think it was a combination of all that because um, it took us a long time to do this. It didn't work just purely on cost. We had to show that we were actually getting um, at least an equivalent service, um, and that the security was going to be at least equivalent, and that um, any issues that we might have as far as replacement of hardware, software, downtime were all going to be at least equivalent. So we actually wound up the last thing we did, which I think really kind of sealed the deal, is we actually put together um, an RFQ. And um, we sent it to um, NITSI as well as the, the government agency. The one we sent it to, frankly, we sent it to, we, we sent it to six government agencies and six industry cloud providers. Um, and the one that we we um, ultimately went with in government, which was NTIS, is the one that came back that met all the requirements um, and still had uh, the lowest cost that was on there. So I think that is the, the, the final thing that actually made it. It was really a combination of factors. Um, and so now we kind of do the whole RFQ thing whenever we decide um, that our internal data center is not going to work. Um, and we go out and do our homework ahead of time so that we can say, this is why we want to go to this particular place, be it commercial, be it other government. Now, I will tell you, we still give NITSI right of first refusal most times and give them the opportunity to match anything that's out there, but they have a pricing structure where they sometimes can't do that. So, And uh, I get that. But th again, that's why I still think that shared services ought to, uh, and this is my opinion, not USDA's opinion, but I think shared services ought to uh, be a commodity just like anything else. You ought to be, we ought to be able to pick and choose just like we do with you guys. You put out an RFQ, and uh, whoever responds and meets your requirements at a reasonable cost, that's who you go with. Okay. Well, if there's nothing else, um, I want to thank you guys all for the opportunity to speak here today. Um, it was a lot of fun. Um, trust me, I can talk for much longer if I need to. But uh, I know you guys are all busy. I've actually got to go home and receive some furniture. I'm moving back into my house today. So uh, um, if you have any more questions later on, um, I guess get them to ACT IAC. I'll be happy to, to answer them if I can. Um, and hopefully I will see all of you guys on Tuesday at our professional development um, seminar downtown after hours um, on the 24th, 5 to 7, American Institute of Architects.